this week we're going to hear about Britain and Europe, in fact this week and next week. Uh, and uh, the lecturer is Professor Simon Hicks, great European expert and indeed crucially head of the government department. Simon. Thank you, Tony. So as Tony said, um, two weeks on Britain and Europe. Um, <coughs> and I just came from lunchtime today with a, a roundtable discussion with the uh, head of the European Directorate in the Cabinet Office on strategies for Britain in Europe. The government clearly needs help. Um, and uh, next week, so this week I'm going to talk about the history, how did we get to the mess we're in now. And next week I'll talk about how do we perhaps get out of this mess. Um, and here's a way to think about how we started off. The relationship between Britain and Europe didn't start very well. Um, this is a alleged headline from a newspaper in the 1930s, fog in the channel, continent cut off. This is meant to epitomise Britain's view of the continent. We are, and it epitomise generally the sense that we are better than them over there. We're superior in every way. We're more sophisticated, more civilised, more democratic. We've got the oldest parliament and so on. And they're sort of Johnny come lately democracies. We are civilization, and um, they want to really join us, not the other way round. And that was generally the sense of Britain's attitude towards the rest of the continent for a long time. Um, while the other, the six then European community member states set up the European Coal and Steel Community in 1952, and then we're discussing setting up um, the European Economic Community um, in the late 50s, which then led to the Treaty of Rome. There was a, the Spark Committee, Paul Henry Spark was chairing a committee. Britain were delegates or represented on that committee. Uh, when, and Britain at that time was discussing whether or not it would sign up and join to create this European common market along with those six. Here is a famous quote from the British delegate Russell Bretherton at that meeting um, as he left the meeting. The future treaty which you are discussing has no chance of being agreed. If it was agreed, it would have no chance of being ratified. If it were ratified, it would have no chance of being applied. If it was applied, it would be totally unacceptable to Britain. You speak of agriculture, which we don't like, of power over customs, which we take exception to, and institutions which frighten us. Monsieur le Président, Messieurs, au revoir et bon chance. And then he left the room. Um, so. This sounds pretty similar to the British attitude 30-something years later to Economic and Monetary Union. Oh, we'll put it in the treaty because, of course, we don't believe that the rest of you will ever get round to setting up a single currency. And if you did, it wouldn't work and you'll then all have to tear it up and start again. And clearly that didn't happen, those crises. But as I'm going to argue uh, through this and next week, one of the key themes of Britain's relationship with the rest of the EU is they always underestimate the ability of the rest of the Europe to find a way to muddle through crisis after crisis. And Britain always likes to stand on the sidelines and saying, see, we told you so, you're never going to get out of this crisis. And then when they do, we have egg on our face. As an alternative, Britain deliberately set up um, European Free Trade Association as a counterweight to what was then a sort of deeper economic integration already with the European Economic Community. So it founded in January 1960 in Stockholm. The first Secretary General, in fact, the first two Secretary Generals were British. Eight, eight original members, um, if you count uh, Finland, who joined one year afterwards. But seven original, add Finland is eight. This was then thought of as the outer eight versus the inner six. Immediately after being set up, the UK, Denmark, and Ireland then applied to join the EEC. Uh, eventually did in 73, Portugal did in 86, Austria, Sweden and Finland, and gradually then uh, the European Free Trade Association eroded, is now left with only Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein. I like to think of this relationship now that EFTA has with the EU, known as the European Economic Area, as a Puerto Rico relationship with Europe. Puerto Rico, as I'm no doubt, you are no doubt aware, is a commonwealth of the United States. A commonwealth of the United States entitles Puerto Ricans to free movement of people within the United States. In, in return, the Puerto Ricans have to apply all e US law, um, and they, have to, uh, they don't pay federal taxes, but they aren't represented in the federal institutions. Sounds like Norway's relationship with the EU to me. Then, 
after having seen actually, oh my goodness, the common market looks like it's working, most of our trade is with France and Germany and the Benelux and not actually with these periphery states, um, Britain then says, oh please let us in, we made a mistake. Uh, Macmillan applies in 61, de Gaulle vetoes, famously said uh, we, if we don't, can't let Britain in, Britain is fundamentally different to the continent and really, you know, the French have, have since then have seen us as saboteurs, if they let us in they're only going to try and sabotage us. Um, he was probably right. Um, he vetoed Wilson, the Labour government, crucially it's interesting you had a Conservative government originally applying, Labour government then applied the second time, de Gaulle vetoes again and only after de Gaulle leaves and Pompey do a more Anglo file uh, French president comes in, there's a new summit in 69, um, the Conservative government then comes to power and applies again, UK, Ireland and Denmark finally join in 73, Labour in opposition is not happy with the terms of the, the membership and then says if we win an election we will renegotiate the terms of our relationship and we'll put it to a referendum, sound familiar. Um, so they then had a referendum. At the time they called the referendum, the public attitudes to Britain overwhelmingly on the left was a very opposed to Britain being a member of the then, what we called it mistakenly, a common market. It never was a common market. That's a very Anglo conception of what it was. It always was a European community, a political community from the beginning. Um, at the time, when they first called the referendum, the opinion polls were showing two-thirds in favour of us not being in the common market, one third in favour. By the time they actually had the referendum, uh, w the referendum result was two thirds voting yes to stay in, one third voting to leave. What is also interesting is it became a sort of a referendum not just on Britain in the European communities, it became a referendum on who do you trust? And they lined up all the moderate leaders of all the mainstream parties on one side and all the loonies from the parties on the left and right on the other and the voters went, oh my God, I disagree with these guys on the moderate side, but I definitely trust them more than that lot, and they ended up this coming out and voting for a yes, including Maggie, as I'm going to come to in a minute. What's interesting is this was actually the results of the 75 referendum by county across the UK. So the darker the colour, um, sorry, the darker the green colour, um, the more, the larger the majority, the lighter the green colour, the smaller the majority, and in fact the reds, actually a majority, uh, a plurality voting uh, to leave. What's interesting is Scotland, the w Western Isles, um, the Northern Isles, the Highlands, Scotland in general and Northern Ireland, much more anti-European at that time than England. Within England you have the most pro-European part of England is where my parents live in Shoreham by Sea in West Sussex, now a part of the country that votes overwhelmingly for UKIP how the world has turned, whereas the Scots we now think of as pro-European. So one big change, one big transformation is what Europe represents. Back then, Europe represented overwhelmingly uh, uh, you know, advantages for the free market right. If we join Europe, Europe is actually far, the European common market is far more liberal and free market than we are in Britain. They're going to force us to liberalise our economy. That's what the treaty is doing. It's going to force us to uh, liberalise competition policy, to break up it, our industrial interests. And so the right was in favour of it. The left was opposed. They saw the European economic community as some sort of capitalist plot to undermine the British socialist state. Amazing. But then Thatcher comes to power as a pro-European and says, um, well, actually, I have a project for Europe. A project for Europe is to extend what I have done in Britain to the rest of the continent and to actually generally create a single market for Europe. It was Thatcher's project and she did a deal with Mitterrand on the left after Mitterrand was persuaded by his right-hand man Jacques Delors to become pro-European and to become more economically liberal. There was a coalition from Thatcher to Mitterrand. Or Thatcher said we want a liberal, pro uh, we want a continental scale market that will be a liberal free market. Mitterrand said we want a continental scale market so we can have integration of industries so we can have European industrial champions to compete with the Japanese and the Americans. So that coalition of Thatcher through to Mitterrand then was in favour of the single market. I'm not going to talk a lot about the budget rebate, that goes right, that's not just Thatcher, that goes right through to Wilson. Wilson was arguing he wanted uh, the settlement on the original setup of the EU budget, it was overwhelmingly a Franco-German deal that favoured French farmers and agricultural interests. Britain wasn't getting much out of the cap. 
Um, Thatcher famously fought a battle with the other member states and managed to get a deal for the UK budget rebate, so the UK gets money back from the Commission. Right till today, of course, this is a mantra of British politics. We must not give up our rebate, as if we're the only country that gets a rebate. All net contributors into the EU budget get a rebate. It's a generalised budget rebate for all EU net contributor member states now. Delors becomes Commission President. Margaret Thatcher loves Delors. Uh, ironically, she sees him as her man from Paris. Uh, she vetoes Claude Chesson, who she thinks is a socialist, a uh, federalist. Delors, who she thinks is a free marketeer, moderate. Um, he's, a, he's a Christian, whatever she likes that about him. Um, Lord Cofield, her commissioner, it becomes the commissioner responsible for internal market, leading the project for a single market. And the Single European Act then imp in integrates into the EU the commitment to create a single market across Europe by 31st of December 1992, the 1992 project. And at that time, you can go back and read um, newspapers, The Economist, the FT, Le Monde, uh, Süddeutsche, whatever you want, the New York Times, and they were very sceptical. Up to that point, the EU, has, the European communities, has not done very much. They sign an agreement amongst the governments to, c to create a single market by the end of 1992, which would involve removing barriers to the free movement of goods, services, capital and labour, and passing 300 pieces of legislation to do it. Nobody believed they would do it. The EU did it. It's the single most significant supranational achievement in history that's ever been achieved. Um, the creation of a continental scale market removing barriers to the free movement of goods, services, capital, labour, and Margaret Thatcher did it. And you, but what's uh, interesting is the debates in the House of Commons, which I looked up again for this. There's an obsession in the House of Commons over some really little, relatively insignificant bits in the Single European Act. Nobody really cared about some of the other elements of the Single European Act, like qualified majority voting for social policy or qualified majority voting for environmental policy. They were obsessed in the House of Commons with things like changing the name of the European Assembly to the European Parliament and how that's terrible and actually we must stop that and you know that assumes then that this has legislative powers which actually already did have legislative powers in the treaties ever since the Treaty of Rome um, so this this to me seems like absurd that they would obsess in the House of Commons about these things but then you'll see they obsess about some odd things in the House of Commons relating to Europe Thatcher then suddenly turns against Europe, having been an avid pro-European, apart from her little side battle over the budget rebate. She's leading Europe with her single market project. By the end of the 1980s, she's now, early 1990s, she's now worried that Delors has gone native. He comes out as a Euro-Federalist, as a socialist European social agenda, which she, prom she claims she never signed up to, yet it's her ministers that signed the treaty, it's her MPs in the House of Commons that voted for the treaty, she claims she never signed up to the social elements of the Single European Act. And the famous Bruges speech where I would urge you actually to go back and read the whole thing because it's not actually as anti-European as you might think. The sort of mantra from UKIP and the Tory right is this was a great statement of Euroscepticism. It's not actually. It's actually quite a pro-European speech by Thatcher. Uh, given the current context of the current debate in the UK. Except everyone likes to focus on this statement. We have not successfully rolled back the frontiers of the state in Britain, only to see them reimposed at a European level with a European superstate exercising a new dominance from Brussels. She's worried now. She's created a single European Act. What she forgets is this was a deal. A deal is Britain gets the single market in return for France and Germany demanding common European social standards, common environment standards, common health and safety at work, common competition policies, all the other bells and whistles that come along with creating a market. She sees these things as reimposing the state from Brussels. She also commits Britain to join the exchange rate mechanism and under pressure she claims in her diaries from Howe, Lawson and Major, she was totally opposed to this she claims, but under pressure from these people around her, these silly men who she now doesn't like, um, they forced her to agree to join the ERM in October 1990. Also in October 1990, she claims in her book she was ambushed by the Christian Democrat leaders who'd met in a summit of the European People's Party. The Christian Democrats in Brussels had met two days before the European Council in Rome and they had agreed they would push for a vote in the European Council by a qualified majority to set up an intergovernmental conference on economic and monetary union and an intergovernmental conference on political union. 
she's on the losing side of the vote and they take a vote to set up a, a, an intergovernmental conference to create a political union in Europe. This then leads to the Maastricht Treaty. A month later, Howe resigns over Thatcher's European policy and in a famous statement to the House of Commons, he said it is rather like sending your opening batsmen to the crease only for them to find that their bats have been broken before the game by the team captain. So, you know, she's, they agree a European policy and what they're going to do, and he goes off and negotiates it, and then she finds that her own advisers behind the scenes have been advising other governments that actually prime, the Prime Minister of the UK disagrees with the official policy that her ministers are now negotiating in Brussels. So he says, I've had enough of this, I'm out. At the same time, of course, we have some poll tax riots and a few things happening in Britain, and then she quits in November 1990, ambushed by, not Christian Democrats, ambushed by her own party. Major then comes in, he miraculously wins an election with his soapbox travelling around the country um, and suddenly we have several key events that really galvanise the anti-Europeans in the Conservative Party. The mainstream of the party until this point was relatively pro-European with only a few backbench anti-Europeans. Thatcher was, had become anti-European but the bulk of her parliamentary party was still pro-European until this period. So Black Wednesday was, a, was where Soros was betting gazillions against uh, the pound and the lira at the same time. And um, when I was doing my PhD in Florence at the European University Institute, we had Giuliano Amato, who's the, who was the Italian prime minister at this time. And I remember him giving a seminar saying that he got a phone call from, uh, from uh, Cole saying, hi, Giuliano, I've just been talking to the Bundesbank and I can't, I haven't got, we haven't got enough money to keep bailing out the lira to keep, keep propping up the lira. Soros is betting far more against us selling lira than I can put buying lira. So we're going to have to let you go. Good luck, Giuliano. And so the phone went down and the phone, the phone rang and it's meter on. Good luck, Giuliano. And then, you know, and then Major phones him, good luck, Giuliano. And he said three days later he had the joy of phoning John Major and saying, good luck, John. As the same thing had happened to the pound and they kicked us out of the ERM. This struck in the British minds, of course, that, you know, the rest of Europe didn't come to help us and we were, you know, we, we committed ourselves to sign up to the ERM. The, the whole single market currency project is dead. There's no way we can have a single currency in Europe. That lasted a few weeks for the rest of the EU member states. They drew the opposite conclusions from this event. This is exactly why we need a single currency, not separate currencies tied together loosely in an ERM. If we had a single currency, there's no way Soros and the currency speculators can bet against our individual currencies because we'll all just have one currency. And so it's interesting that the, a completely different inference was drawn by most, almost all of the other EU member states from this period of, of the crisis in the ERM. At the same time, a couple of months later, they agree the, the they sign the uh, cross the I, dot the I's cross the T's on the Maastricht Treaty. The UK major at the last minute uh, managed to negotiate an opt out from the social chapter, which is the, an element in the treaties that commits the EU to more uh, social legislation, like the working time directive we now have. Um, when it's ratified in the House of Commons, Major is defeated by a Labour amendment on the social chapter, which his own radical backbenchers, his own anti-European backbenchers are backing Labour just to defeat the government on the tre treaty. The government loses a vote, with then 22 rebels voting against the government, led by this chap, Bill Cash. He comes back to haunt us later, but I'll show you. He's a good friend of mine, so don't worry. Um, <coughs> Government majority in the Commons is only 1822. You might say, that's not many rebels. We're used to them in the hundreds now, right? But that was the biggest ever rebellion against the government in parliamentary history at that point. This was really transformative. Um, and Major then calls a vote of confidence. A vote of confidence to say, if I lose this vote, I'm going to resign and we're going to have an election and Labour are going to win, basically, at this point. So he calls a vote of confidence to force these rebels to back him. This is the start then of the backbench rebels, anti-European rebels in the House of Commons against the leadership. Major then creates another veto moment. Uh, a year later, he vetoes Jean-Luc Dahan, the Belgian Christian Democrat Prime Minister for Commission President, and he gets Jacques Santerre, the Luxembourg Prime Minister instead, who he feels is far less federalist. Um, this you'll see as a running theme up until the present. Meanwhile, we have Labour in opposition. Labour in opposition in 1983, its longest suicide note in history, has in its manifesto, 
that they want to withdraw from the community is the right withdrawal from the community is the right policy for Britain. So Labour officially was in favour of us leaving the European community in 1983. They lose the election disastrously. Kinnock and the Kinnockites uh, come to power as the, as the moderates pro-Europeans in the party to reform the party. They're still moderately Eurosceptic during this period. Thatcher is seen as pro-European with a single market project. They're lefties, they're Labour, they're opposed to the kind of free market, single market. De Law comes to the TUC Congress in Bournemouth. Here he is. And he makes an impassioned speech that says that you guys are losing in London with Thatcher. We can win it back in Brussels. We have socialist prime ministers and a socialist group in the European Parliament and a powerful European trade unions. And in the single European Act, we have social rights for British workers. And me as the Commission President are trying to push these through. The only way in a globalised world we're going to have social rights, common social rights, is if we have these at the European level, not at the national level. So your kind of national socialism doesn't work. It failed in France. We realised that. It would also fail in Britain. We can only have socialism together at the European level. He gets a standing ova ovation and spontaneous chorus of Frère Jacques starts through the TUC Congress. And suddenly, this is like an epiphany moment for Labour, and they tear up their policy documents before that point, and now all of a sudden they're hugely pro-European. In fact, in 1997, they're in favour of a single currency, in favour of Britain joining the euro, and they commit in their manifesto that Britain would join the euro and there would be a referendum. They would put a policy to Britain, join, and they will promise a referendum on Britain joining the euro. That's how, that's kind of high watermark of a party coming into power with the most pro-European statement we've ever seen from a British party in government. The British press has a completely different view of Delors by now. Up yours Delors at midday tomorrow, Sun readers are urged to tell the French fool where to stuff his EQ. This is the attitude of the Sun on the 1st of November 1990. Um, and you get through this period, through the late 1990s, through to the Early, from the sort of mid-80s through the 90s to the early 2000s, a drip, drip, drip of anti-European stories from the press, Murdoch and Black-owned press in particular. A cynical side of me would say that the, what they fear most of all is press regulation from Brussels. E, sorry, EU regulation of the press in Brussels. But Blair comes to power. Huge enthusiasm for Tony Blair. Seen as the saviour of UK-EU relations. He, uh, this is him at his very first summit. All the other leaders are jostling to have their photo taken, the, the, the then equivalent of the selfie with Tony Blair. There he is. They, the Dutch Prime Minister organised the, all the Prime Ministers riding around Amsterdam on their bikes. Blair, Blair deliberately cycles to the front and starts waving to the crowd, and they're all cheering Tony Blair, the leader of Europe. He immediately signs up to the social chapter, um, he managed, Blair's buddy, his friend Romano Prodi becomes the Commission President. It's all going swimmingly for Britain in Europe. Britain is now a leader of Europe, a Blairite agenda of the third way for Europe, of a balance between a free market and a social Europe, and Blair's the sort of epitome of this. And the British press responds, is this the most dangerous man in Britain? The Euro looms, and this is in... Uh, 1998, June 1998. Bear in mind Murdoch has backed Blair to get elected and within a year he's now turned against him on the question of Europe and they've got a kind of scary photo of Blair to go along with it. They're now saying that th he wants to take us into the Euro and this would be a disaster for Britain and they're promising to now back the Tories in the next election. And all of a sudden Labour starts to, uh, Labour's pro-European policy starts to unravel. Gordon Brown as the Chancellor emerges as relatively Eurosceptic. Um, he says that there will be five economic tests that need to be passed before Britain can join the euro. Are business cycles and economic structures compatible? If problems emerge, is there sufficient flexibility to deal with them? Would joining EMEO create better conditions for firms investing in Britain? What would be the impact of on UK financial services? Will joining EMEO promote growth, stability and increasing jobs? Not unreasonable questions. So he assesses these as the Treasurer gets the Treasury to assess these. This is meant to tie the hands of the Prime Minister who seems to be gung-ho about us joining the Euro. And the Treasury assessment says we don't meet these five tests, therefore our recommendation is that we shouldn't join the Euro. End of story. Meanwhile the Euro gets set up in 1999. 
Um, and then currents, notes and coins introduced in 2002, of course, then we get the Iraq War. And this is now where Blair, from having been the saviour or seen as the hero, hugely popular on the continent, becomes seen incredibly negatively on the continent. Nobody in, on the continent, particularly on the left, can understand why Bla Blair signs up to Bush's coalition of the willing, particularly when the French and the Germans are totally opposed. Um, there's speculation on the continent that he's doing this because uh, he prayed with George Bush. Uh, this is what the narrative the French press like to, to say. Uh, this is all to do with some kind of religious connection between the two. They're scratching their heads. They just do not understand how they can do this. What they miss is that Blair actually was a liberal interventionist. And he'd said this in a series of speeches in that period. And so he saw the sort of the, the uh, kind of imperialist image of the Britain, British liberal interventionist is not that different from an American neocon in practice when it comes to intervening in other parts of the world for the greater good of mankind. Uh, at the same time, he engineers a coup against the French and the Germans for the next commission president. Uh, France and Germany the, the, are backing uh, for Hofstadt, the, the Guy for Hofstadt, the Belgian prime minister, liberal prime minister to be uh, commission president. Uh, Blair backs Barroso. Barroso is important here because Barroso chaired the Azores summit which was the coalition of the willing that got together in the Azores with the Americans, the Brits, the Italians, the Spanish, the Portuguese and the East Europeans and not the French and the Germans. He manages to engineer a qualified majority in favour of Barroso. The, the treaty has now changed the from unanimous decision making to qualified majority decision making for choosing the commission president. Barroso is now chosen as commission president against Chirac who's totally opposed and uh, one evidence of Chirac uh, how badly the French repose is when the new commission forms the French are given the transport portfolio in the commission which is the worst portfolio the French government has ever had. So this is seen as you know r deep divisions now within the EU are you on the Atlanticist wing with, led by Blair and Barroso or are you a, a Europe, continental European? France and Germany are at their lowest in terms of their influence in the way the EU works at this point. Negotiating on the constitutional treaty, Blair promises a referendum so he can then force the negotiating hands of the other EU member states. In response, Chirac does exactly the same. If you're going to have a referendum, we're going to have a, refer a, refer a referendum. He then, of course, resigns. Brown then becomes Prime Minister. Brown is seen on the continent as far more Eurosceptic than Blair. In fact, he hardly shows up to meetings when he was the Chancellor. When he did show up to meetings of finance ministers, he loved to just hector the other finance ministers from the other member states and how great the British economy is doing and how great our public finances are compared to the rest of you. Fog in the channel, continent cut off mentality. <laughs> Um, and he does the same when he's Prime Minister. He goes to the first European Council and he says, we're just far better than you lot, you just need to copy us. And chickens come home to roost a few years later, of course, as the Germans remind us about the current state of British public finances and see it all as Brown's fault. And they say, ha ha. So, you know, at this point, we have this, hopefully. In Europe now, we've got a new thing. The European Union, 500 million people, 200 languages. No one's got a clue what they're saying for each other. <laughs> But it's a cutting edge of politics in a very extraordinarily boring way. <laughs> because 15 we've got 50 different countries in the European Union at the moment, and trying to get them to decide anything is a little bit. But, oh, wait, is it? Oh, no, back up. You, oh, you're with him? Oh, no. oh, you're with him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> For 18 years, we had a government in Britain who was a right wing government, and their policy towards Europe was one of. No, 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 Now we've got a government whose policy is much more bonjour, hola, tac, ta, bang, bang, bang. <laughs> Britain needs to be in the driving seat of Europe, in the driving seat, or in the passenger seat, that's pretty good, you know, because then you can take a sleep for a bit. Are we there, yes? Yeah. Uh, at the moment, Britain isn't even in the European car. We're outside the car, at the traffic lights, going, we're going to clean your windows, all right? <laughs> So that <laughs> epitomised to me the state of British relations uh, towards the end of the Labour government, of course, at the great Eddie Izzard. So Cameron then comes to power. And in a very short space of time, he manages to piss off everybody else in Europe. 
It doesn't mean to. The poor guy doesn't really know much about Europe. And the first thing is during the election campaign to be leader of, of the Conservative Party, he's way behind in the polls to David Davis. And suddenly, some bright spark in his team has this... How can he signal his anti-European credentials without it meaning very much? And he says, oh, how about we promise to pull out of those... EPP guys in Brussels, the who? He's never heard of them. The European People's Party, the guy, you know, the, the Christian Democrats, the Federalists, you know, we can just say if we pull out of them because they're too Euro Federalist and, and we'll, we'll, we'll go sit in our own group and we'll thumb our nose and actually nobody cares about the European Parliament and nobody cares about the EPP. So it's a very cheap and easy way to signal our anti European credentials. So he does it immediately. This pisses off everybody he needs as his allies. The three people who are most upset are Merkel, the German Chancellor in the EPP, and Donald Tusk and Reinfeldt. Reinfeldt, who he's been schmoozing for years, um, the Prime Minister of Sweden and Tusk, the Prime Minister of Poland, um, they thought that there was now, following on from Blair and the, and the, the sort of Franco-German coalition in the middle, they thought there was a kind of Atlanticist, Scandinavian, East European coalition that was more free market, more global, more Atlanticist, led by these kind of liberal centre-right people, the new modern centre-right, as epitomised by Tusk in Poland and Reinfeldt in Sweden. And they thought David Cameron in London, and, and they, they, there had been a vote in the EPP to elect the leader of the EPP in the European Parliament. And it was a very tight vote between the Swedes and the French, and the French won it by five votes, and they'd made the calculations that after the 2009 elections, they would be able to win it, because the Conservatives would be back, and they would they, then this kind of anti-Franco-German group within the EPP would actually be the leaders of the EPP in the European Parliament. But with Cameron leaving, that's all dead. And they are livid. 2010 election, they come to power. Bill Cash, who was once the person that the leadership didn't speak to on the back benches, the leader of the Maastricht Rebels, suddenly is the order of the day and is now the chair of the European Scrutiny Committee in the House of Commons with a remit to summon every pro-European in the country and try and embarrass them in front of the committee, hence why I have to go there every few months. Um, but, you know, what they're going to do is they're nego going to negotiate a new EU Act to pass through the Parliament. So the EU bill gets published and it commits Britain to have a referendum on any transfer of any powers to Brussels, even, for example, moving from unanimous voting to qualified majority voting for the introduction of a carbon tax would now have to be put to a referendum in the UK under the law as it currently exists in this country. Cameron vetoes the Fiscal Compact Treaty, the famous veto. Um, here he is vetoing the Fiscal <coughs> Compact Treaty. The real story is the following. He wants now to renegotiate certain parts of the treaty. He wants un unanimity for financial services. He wants a repatriation of powers on social policies, Britain opting out of the social chapter. He wants Britain opting out of justice and home affairs. He wants to get rid of ever closer union, which he's not going to get. Um, but so he goes, the rest of the EU member states are in the midst of the Euro crisis and they want to change the treaties, to put into the treaties the mechanisms to save the euro. They want the European Stability Mechanism, which is the bailout fund, and they want the set of rules governing how member states must police their public finances. And Cameron comes along to the meeting and says, I'm willing to allow you guys to have this in the treaty if you give me these things for the UK. Now, expecting Britain to do that, two days before, there was an EPP summit. Remember them, the guys he left? There was an EPP summit in Marseille, and I got a phone call from a Danish journalist saying, Simon, you won't believe it, the EPP have just agreed a treaty text that excludes the UK. His advisers had missed it. I knew about it. His advisers had missed it. They admitted afterwards they'd missed it. He went on the Sunday to the meeting. It went into the meeting with Merkel to give her demands, and she went, thank you, Dave. Here's our treaty text that excludes the UK. He then walks out and says, I vetoed the treaty, I vetoed these things being in the treaty because there's nothing else he can do. So, in a sense, the other member states refused to be blackmailed by Britain and they showed us, they thumbed their nose at us in a deal that had been brokered at an EPP summit in Marseille. 2012, if you, that's not enough to piss everyone else off, it gets even worse. So now there's a discussion in the House of Commons about should the Britain renew its loans to the IMF? So we. We've never lost money in the IMF. We always make money by giving money to the IMF that gives loans to the developing world mainly. The IMF at this time was also giving loans as part of the Eurozone bailout packages. And the backbenchers of the Conservatives insist they have to put a clause into the 
passage of this through the House of Commons that says that Britain is only going to give loans to the IMF if these money cannot be used to bail out Greece. It's okay to bail out dictators in the developing world, but it's not okay to bail out our buddies in southern Europe. You can imagine how this goes down again on the rest of the continent. No, no, that's not enough. There's now, you see, the rise of UKIP. UKIP, the Conservatives have come to power. They're in coalition with those Liberals, the backbenchers of the party, the, the, the radical elements of the party, the older rural members of the party don't like the fact the government is being run by these urban metrosexuals who are in favour of gay marriage and things like that. Um, and they, they're not doing enough to kick out the foreigners. UKIP starts to rise in the polls. This is a big threat to Conservative backbenchers. Not only are they not going to win a majority in the House of Commons probably at the next election anyway, but the rise of UKIP really damaged, challenges a lot of their seats. They could lose some of these to Labour. They could even lose a majority to Labour. Even if Labour gets 30 to 35% of the vote, they could get a majority in the House of Commons. The backbenchers in the party are clamouring for the leadership to do something to appease UKIP. And so the first thing is then there's a, a vote 81 Conservative backbenchers. Remember, it was only 22 under Major. He's now facing 81, and he hasn't got a majority. This is 81 of a minority. 81 Conservative backbenchers propose a bill to the House of Commons calling for an in-out referendum, and they vote for it uh, against the government. Then there's a discussion from then through 2012. What is he going to do about this? He promises he's going to make a major speech. This gets delayed, delayed, delayed. Eventually, he decides he's going, he does make the speech. It's tabled for January 2013 in Bloomberg in the Netherlands. That's not Bloomberg in New York. I, one newspaper thought Bloomberg was in New York. <sighs> the British press, anyway. Why he would go to New York to make a speech about Europe, I don't know. But anyway, um, and he makes a speech where he promises a referendum. He's very clever in this speech. In fact, at the time, it's probably the most pro-European speech a British Prime Minister could have made. You start to feel sorry for the guy now. You realise he doesn't really know much about Europe. He's now starting to realise um, there's a lot of cr British critical economic interests Britain has with the rest of Europe. Most of our trade is with the rest of Europe. It could potentially be disastrous if we get, if by mistake we leave the EU. But he thinks, how can I appease UKIP? And he says, I want there to be a reform of the EU in a more liberal direction, and I want there to be um, some checks and balances for Britain's role, preserving Britain's interests in the single market. Um, despite the deeper economic and monetary union that's going ahead with the other member states. And I'm going to talk more next week about that. And he says, if we can get this new settlement for Britain, then I will put this to a referendum. It's about time we had a referendum in Britain because we, the, we haven't settled this for a generation. Meanwhile, lots of other countries have had referendums. Um, they then publish a referendum bill. The government publishes a referendum bill, but they're not going to actually put it to Parliament because... Um, they can't agree in the coalition to do it. Uh, a private member, uh, James Wharton MP, proposes the bill. It passes the House of Commons. It's now currently blocked in the House of Lords. It's probably going to be blocked until the election. Meanwhile, the Daily Telegraph now reports that a member of Cameron's inner circle has described local members of the party as mad, swivel-eyed loonies, to which the local members of the party start to rebel. This is a lovely picture of the local members in, the Med in Medway. Glad to be swivel-eyed loonies. Uh, but you can now see a, a rift being driven between a leadership desperately trying to cling to some semblance of a kind of moderately pro-European but pretending to be as sceptical as we possibly could without upsetting too many people on the continent um, or the city of London, which is now very worried, um, while appeasing back their local members who are in droves going off to join UKIP and this chap here, Nigel. Meanwhile, what has happened to UK uh, public opinion? So, ever since the early 70s, every six months, a um, Eurobarometer, uh, which is a, a opinion polls funded by the European Commission but implemented by private polling agencies in every EU member state, samples about 1,000 citizens in every EU member state and asks them a batch of questions. Until 2010, um, one of the key questions that was asked was, do you think your country's membership of the EU is a good thing? Now, it's a nice simple question. It's not even in favour of European integration. Do you identify with Europe? It's a very simple question. And this then is the general EU trend, the average across all EU member states. You can see growing enthusiasm for Europe in the 
a period of uh, completing the single market applications to European studies programs at the LSE, follow the same trajectory, by the way. Uh, um, then this is UK public opinion, much more skeptical than the average starts to become, pretty pro-European during this period. Uh, in the late 80s, early, then suddenly you see a precipitous fall after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Maastricht Treaty, the unlocking of public opposition to Europe all across Europe and then hovering around the 50% mark for the other EU member states, climbing a bit in the early 2000s and then starting to collapse after Eastern enlargement and starting to collapse with the Eurozone crisis. In this period, Britain is not that different to the average EU member state in the early 90s. So when Blair's comes to power in 97, the British public is relatively pro-European, not that different from the European average and gradually it separates. What's interesting is the contrast with Denmark. Denmark, another EU member state that was very sceptical, not ideologically uh, committed to European integration like some of the more continental powers, very worried about German dominance of Europe and a big issue of Germans buying houses in Denmark and that being in the Treaty of Rome, free movement of persons, Germans, rich Germans going to buy all the nice Danish uh, beach houses. As sceptic as the Brits in this period and then suddenly they start to separate and Denmark gradually becomes pro-European, much more pro-European than the European average, in fact. These are the referendums. That was the British referendum. Every time you have a referendum, it goes, public support goes up. Here's the Danish referendum on the Single European Act. Support then goes up. Here's the two Danish referendums on the Maastricht Treaty. It starts to collapse, but you can argue the collapse came a bit later. The two referendums on the Amsterdam Treaty. Denmark has had re repeated widespread public debate, much, much higher levels of public understanding about Europe, Denmark's relationship with Europe, and a series of you know, very brutal referendums, but overall the Danish public now is relatively settled. They see that you know, Europe, we don't particularly like the EU, but we feel it's generally, it's far more um, balanced, lots of checks and balances in Europe. The model as created by the EU is not that different to the Danish model of a mix between free market capitalism and, and some sort of common minimum social and environmental standards. Denmark seems pretty comfortable with that and has sort of come to a settled view of that. The Danish parliament very active in constraining its own ministers. Interestingly in Britain we have gone in a different direction and we could perhaps talk about why that might be. In sum, here's how I'd summarise the whole history from 73 to the present. Well, the dominant policy since about 1960, after we realised we made a mistake not joining, the dominant policy has been we need to get to the top table to prevent everybody else going ahead without us. We made this terrible mistake of allowing them to design the European communities without us at the top table. Had we been at that top table, we wouldn't have had the common agricultural policy. We'd have had the budget designed differently. We could even have had a single market earlier. So we need, to be, we need to be a key player with the French and the Germans and the other EU member states. Another key theme is we've seen divisions in both major parties throughout the period. At some periods part, the parties have looked united and other periods they've looked divided. But in fact, if you look closely, there's been splits in both of the parties. So right back to Labour, Wilson was pro-European, Gateskill was very anti-European, very, very passionate speech in the 60s about why Britain should not join the, the, the internal market. Through to the 1990s, Thatcher versus Clark, Clark as a pro-European and the fights going on now within the Conservative Party and Labour in opposition, the battle within the Labour Party in opposition actually marked by the fact that they're in opposition. Ed Balls is far, far more Eurosceptic than Ed Miliband, for example. And my understanding of the reason why they don't really have a European policy right now is those two can't agree. On the other hand, you can say there has been quite a dramatic change. Originally, the opposition to Europe in Britain was overwhelmingly on the left. Europe was seen as a free market project to undermine the rights of British workers. Um, to under, you know, and we, the rest of Europe needs to catch us up. Now the opposition is overwhelmingly on the right. Europe is seen as socialism through the back door. Uh, common European social standards, common European environment standards, economic and monetary union. This is some nasty French plot to undermine British small businessmen. We've seen dramatic decline in popular legitimacy and 
much more difficult now for the political elites to actually persuade the publics to change. There's no way you'd see in a referendum campaign the type of shift that you would see back in the 1970s, where you saw a swing from two-thirds opposed to two-thirds in favour in a matter of months. Just look at the Scottish referendum campaign, where the polls have not really shifted over a year, despite heated debates. Same kind of thing would happen now. I don't think you'd see much of a shift in, in a referendum campaign. Um, the question is what would be on the table, what would be the, which I'll come to more next week. Um, it, you, another argument would say that Cameron and Cam the policy of the, the British government, the current British government, is a fundamental break from the past. No longer are we, we must be at the top table um, to make sure they can't go ahead without us. He's actually saying, please go ahead without us. He's in favour of deeper economic and monetary union for the other member states. He wants the euro to be saved. British government was actually the only government in Europe arguing the ECB should be the lender of last resort to bail out the euro to save the euro. Works in Britain, it should work for you guys too. They need the euro to be saved because growth in the British economy is driven primarily by our major export markets and over 50% of our GDP is integrated with the rest of the EU. So if you want growth in Britain, you need the rest of the EU to be growing. After the, the fiscal compact debacle where we vetoed and the other member states went ahead without us, with Britain now demanding opt-outs left, right and centre, Herman Van Rompuy said, why would we negotiate with someone who has one hand on the exit door? Um, and you could, the interesting one of the examples here is the views of Poland. Tusk and the Swedes. The Poles and the Swedes were... British allies in Brussels against the French and the Germans. Now they're very much, particularly the Poles, within the remit of the re-emerged Franco-German engine. Franco-German engine had been eroded by Blair during the 1990s, early 2000s. It's now back at the heart of Europe and they're bringing along with them Poland. You can see the declining influence of the UK. As I've alluded to all the way through, the UK chose every commission president since Roy Jenkins in the early 80s. Jenkins was British. Thatcher vetoed Claude Chesson to get Jacques Delors. After Jacques Delors, Major vetoed Jean-Luc Dehaene and managed to get Jacques Santerre. After Jacques Santerre, Romano Prodi was Tony Blair's proposed commission president. It was his personal close friend from Rome. After Prodi, it was Barroso, and it was Blair who engineered the anti Hofstadt coup against the French and the Germans to get Barroso as commission president. Britain is now out of the room when it now comes to discussion about the next commission president. For the first, you can't even imagine there being a British candidate for any of the top jobs. There will not be a British commission president or British president of the European Council. That's how isolated we have become. And um, Britain has no views on either of these candidates, Schultz and, and uh, Juncker of the EPP and the Socialist. Labour are opposed to Schultz, even though they're a member of a party that's proposed him. The Conservatives aren't even in the EPP. They don't really know who they're going to back for Commission President. And, and it's going to be very awkward for Britain um, after the next European elections to know which way they're going to go on deciding the most powerful office in the EU. Thank you. There you go. Let me just grab my water. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Um, <clears throat> right. Um, well, I'll come to questions in a moment. I just want to begin with one. I mean, this um, division between what the British want out of Europe and the fact it, though it changes from time to time, in the end, again and again and again, what the British want out of Europe is the market bit of it, isn't it? They're, they're, they're more comfortable with the free market, they're a trading country, and they're not at all comfortable with the legislative and social stuff, which, you know, I mean, I mean in fairness to the British, comes from, in many cases, a very different uh, constitutional tradition, very different legal traditions. And so the, the free trade bit has always been more attractive to the British, presumably, than the... Um, legislative and constitutional stuff and to which you can see that the British encouraged did they not other countries to join uh, to, um, to broaden the EU um, in order to walk as it may make some widening of the issues wide, yes widening it in order to make it 
a more difficult institution to run in many ways in order to ensure the market became bigger but the barriers to legislative action became more difficult. And yet, so I'm coming around to a question, um, weirdly this has led to uh, opening out a much higher level of immigration through the market part which itself now plays back into the debate about the future of the EU. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, uh, partly... Uh, well, it may not. Uh, I should have added the other big project of Britain through the Thatcher major period was Eastern Enlargement um, and that you can argue is a major British success story and, and that was partly why I think a lot of the East European member states saw Britain as a natural ally yeah. and, and they feel kind of let down uh, by the British government recently. Let down not just in the bargaining with the French and Germans but let down on the issue of free movement of persons which overwhelmingly is Eastern Europeans. Yeah. Um, and but that itself uh, has now become a barrier. So you can look at the world from London and say, Britain wants the free market. We like the free market, single market, free trading bit of it. We don't like the social policies and the other bells and whistles that come along with it. If you stand in Paris and you look at the EU, you think, what is Britain moaning about? They won on everything. We've lost. They didn't want Eastern enlargement. They didn't want such a liberal single market. They didn't want a global EU leading as a global free trade policy. They didn't want reform of the common agricultural policy, which they've got. They didn't want a universalised rebate for all the net contributor member states, which Britain won. They didn't want a whole load of things. So, you know, if you're in London, you see it as socialism through the back door. If you're in Paris, you see it as some Anglo-Saxon plot to undermine the French farmer um, so that, or the French industrial worker. So. I like to think of it as the French socialists are the most left-wing, mainstream, centre-left party in Europe. The British Conservatives are the most right-wing, mainstream, centre-right party in Europe. If either of these parties were pro-European, we should worry. Everybody between these two parties thinks Europe's pretty much a good thing because it leads to policy outcomes that are more or less a compromise in the centre, which is too far to the left for the British Conservatives and too far to the right for the French socialists. OK, right. Now, questions? Okay. All right, we'll take um, in from the inside. Here they are, colleagues from inside. We'll come back to you. All right, we'll take gentlemen here, there, and then here. So, yeah, I'm supposed to repeat the question. Scott, would Scotland be in Thank the you. EU uh, if there was Scottish independence? My general view of that is um, if Scotland votes for to leave the United Kingdom, um, I think there, it takes quite a long time. It's not that like they vote and then next week they're independent. And there'll be a long negotiation. In part of that process, I think it would be accepted in, by the House of Commons that Scotland wants to leave uh, Britain. And then Britain would negotiate pretty strongly within the EU for Scotland to remain a member of the EU. And I think a lot of other member states would be sympathetic to that. I think they'd worry, very, you know, Spain can be bought off somehow. And I think, you know, it would be very difficult for the Spanish government to say that Scottish citizens, already EU citizens, um, if they leave a current member state, we're, we're taking away their EU citizenship. It was Spain, remember, who actually proposed EU citizenship and got it into the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, and they will be reminded of that fact. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it will be a long and difficult negotiations, but my assumption is politics will, will overtake the kind of legal judicial argument right now. And I, I would be very, very surprised if there is a vote for Scottish independence. Um, and then Scotland has to leave the EU and reapply. I just don't see it politically making any sense. Uh, and they'll, they'll come to some way to appease uh, Spain on that one. Whether Scotland will or not is another matter. Um, I actually think it could be much closer than some people think. The polls may be narrowing. We don't know. I think actually the, 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 um, the, the intervention in the debate of Barroso and of uh, the three parties last, la over the last couple of weeks will, has backfired. Uh, I think it's very dangerous for people in London to, to, to start, you know, pontificating about Scotland. Ultimately, that's easy for Salmon to then say, see, I told you, these guys in London think they can dictate to us. That's exactly why we need independence. It's just very easy to argue against that. And so my expectation it will be close, and then we're going to be getting into a debate about Devo Max or Devo Supermax or something like that. Uh, and various backbenchers of the Conservative Party are in favour of, of that and I think um, they would like to give Alex Salmon Devo Supermax in return for pulling his MPs out of the House of Commons. So just watch this space I think is my issue. And of course that and the question beg the, the fascinating heroic um, sort of 
future counterfactual possibility, or if you can have a future counterfactual, of whether what would happen if Scotland votes on September the 18th to leave the UK, but then, of course, uh, a Labour government or some kind of minority Labour government tries to take office next year after the general election, dependent, heavily dependent on Scottish votes and how that then plays out. I mean, Scott, because, uh, well, it would be very, very, very complicated. It would be very complicated because they'd still be part of the UK at the time. Anyway, now, yeah. chap here. Yeah. Uh, Can you repeat the questions? Um, the part of the uh, pointing to the irony of the British public uh, growing opposition to the EU, uh, and this is in part driven by, or in large part driven by, uh, the anti-democratic or non-democratic nature of the EU, particularly in the way that the Commission President is appointed, but generally decision-making in the EU. Um, I've spent the last 10, 15 years of my life arguing that the EU suffers from a very deep democratic deficit and needs to be fixed, so I am, um, but I don't think my view is that we should be trying to fix that, and I think they have gone some ways towards fixing it. And I, for a long time, have advocated having rival candidates for the Commission President before European elections. This is exactly what we have. We might not like who these people are, but this is what, isn't that what democracy is? Having some link to the choice of who the executive is? I don't, need, don't see why smoke-filled rooms in the European Council is, is more democratic than having an open vote about some rival candidates and some rival agendas for the Commission so the voters can actually see who we vote for, and then how they vote for these people when they get to the European um, level. In, ter in terms of the European Parliament, strictly speaking, the European Parliament had some budgetary powers before the Single European Act. Um, the main change was the Single European Act and the Maastricht Treaty, which gave the European Parliament legislative power. In many sense, the European Parliament as a legislative institution is more powerful than the House of Commons. The House of Commons, we have a parliamentary system where the government can railroad laws through the House of Commons. It was a backbencher of the Labour Party who, who described his career in the House of Commons as throwing paper aeroplanes at a bulldozer. Do you remember who it was? I can't remember. Sounds like Chris Mullin, but no. no. Austin, Austin, Austin Mitchell. Mitchell. Well done. Um, and whereas the European Parliament is like US Congress, they've got to build coalitions issue by issue. What has never been explained to the British people is checks and balances. There's this assumption that the rest of Europe governs us and whatever the Commission says, says gets done. The, all the Commission does is propose law. They think of proposing law like the British government proposing law and then they just railroad it through the House of Commons. It's a checks and balances system. The Commission proposes law. It has to pass through a qualified majority in the Council, a simple majority in the European Parliament, or an absolute majority at second reading, judicial review by the European Court of Justice and judicial review by national courts. It's an uber, uber, uber checks and balances system. And I get so annoyed with the British press that likes to say that they've closed la a lane on the M1 because of the EU has imposed this law on us. A law, by the way, that the British government voted for in the council and that British MEPs voted for in the European Parliament that they never point out. Um, this is part of, you know, this is, it's part of a checks and balances system. It could be far more democratic than it is. The council is the least democratic institution. The British government whinges and moans about the EU's democratic deficit. Open up the council. Give to the House of Commons European Scrutiny Committee all the documents that the British government puts to the council. They do not do that. The Danish government does it. The Finnish government does it. The Swedish government does it. The Irish government does it. The Dutch government does it. The British government doesn't do it. We are the least democratic government in the council vis-a-vis -vis our own national parliament. They should stop whinging and get on with it. But hang on, Simon, surely, but hang on, hang on. Surely though, there is a problem that very few people in Britain, uh, even those who think themselves interested in government and politics, would be able to describe what the relative respective roles of the Commission were and the Parliament were in relation to each other and either of them in relation to the UK government. But it's never been explained. No, no, it's never been explained. Been, but I mean, that, that, but it, it, this is partly why I'm in favour of a referendum. But partly why I'm in favour of referendum. I think there's plenty of evidence that countries that have had referendum... Yes, you can argue referendums are often about other things than what's on the table. But there's plenty of evidence that where they have had referendums on European issues, there's been huge information campaigns. And the, the jump in the Eurobarometer, they have an index of public understanding of, you know, how many members are there in the EU? What's the EU capital? What's the, you know, what does the Commission do? What, where does the European Parliament meet? They have an index that you can... Britain is always at the bottom. We have the lowest level of public understanding. 
you will see a step change when you have referendums in terms of public okay. understandings. I'm in favour of a public Sorry. referendum. We don't normally do this in these lectures, but let's just, let's just take a, a, a show of hands. Who thinks there should be a referendum on whether the UK stays in the EU? And who, th who thinks there shouldn't be? There definitely should just not have one. Next week I'll talk more about options, what might happen going forward. Um, so we can okay. leave that a bit off the table today. I think that was a draw, more or less, actually. And was with the, the second lot of hands coming up a bit more slowly, right? Chap there and then one there, yeah. Yeah, so has Britain got it wrong with the type of people we have backed or supported? Um, so did we just make a bad I don't, th I don't think so. I mean, other member states make, this, have all, have make similar kinds of arguments about their commissioners, for example. I mean, the, we have the saying of they go native when they go to Brussels, but there's a similar sense in a lot of other uh, member states about the people that they've nominated to the commission. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I'm actually really sympathetic to the British government's position right now. I think they find themselves, whoever would be in government in Britain right now would have exactly the same dilemma. Um, if it was Labour or Labour Liberal coalition, it would be exactly the same dilemma. The rest of Europe is building deeper economic and monetary <coughs> union, and the real question for the UK is, should we be isolated inside the EU or isolated outside the EU? That's a question for Britain. The other member states say, that's your choice, Britain. We can't make that choice for you. You have to make that choice. And that's a really, really difficult position for Britain to be in. Could we have with things that have happened with a different kind of historical pathway, ended up in a different situation? Perhaps. I think it might have been different had we not made the mistake back in the 1950s, had Bretherton not made the mistake in the Spark Committee, had we been there? I think that was a fatal error. And I think it took 30 years for that to be repaired. Um, I think we... I think we were very successful through the 1990s and 2000s, and, and right up until very recently, I think Cameron made a mistake with the Fiscal Compact Treaty. I think he really underestimated the will of the other member states. There was a kind of classic British arrogance of, well, they're obviously going to want us to agree, and so they're obviously, you know, so we can ask for demands and they'll give it to us, um, without realizing that this was a really existential crisis for the Eurozone an existential crisis for Germany. The German political elites, the, f the, f of the primary important was save the euro. If the euro dies, the EU dies. If the EU dies, that's the end of German core number one foreign policy strategy for 60 years. Um, and there's nothing, that, so Britain coming in and saying, oh, can we have unanim unanimous voting on financial services under article such and such in the treaty? Then what are you talking about? This was the kind of attitude of, I mean, this, I think, was a terrible, terrible <coughs> diplomatic error. Uh, but it, it's hard to point to other really big diplomatic errors that have happened. We've just, we've ended up in a situation that is largely, a British public feels very differently. It's an island mentality, English speaking, we have an identity with the English speaking world. Um, we have this split identity where, on the one hand, Europeans in some respects, on the other hand, we're Anglo-Saxons and we identify with the Australians and the rest. We play cricket and rugby, you name it. Um, it's a split identity, and it's very difficult to have this split identity with the way the EU is moving. It was fine when it was just a single market with a few bells and whistles, but when you start to say it's now developing into deeper economic and monetary union, which inevitably will mean political union, Germany's talking about a directly elected commission president. That was the German CDU Congress last year motion that passed. Um, this is going to be on the agenda. The rest of Europe is heading in a different direction to Britain. So whoever would be in power... Whoever would be in power in London would be facing exactly the same dilemma as the current government. Josh. Um, Nick v Nigel, who's going to win? I think they both this is, will. This is a reference to the debate between... So a reference to the debates that are going to happen, two debates that will happen between uh, Nick Clegg, Deputy Prime Minister, Leader of the Lib Dems, and Nigel, leader, Nigel Farage, Leader of, the, of UKIP. Um, <coughs> and they both have nothing, nothing to lose. Um, and it was interesting when we had Nigel Farage come and speak at LSE that the Lib Dems was the only other British party he said anything positive about. I mean, he, I think his attitude about the Lib Dems is we agree with them on almost everything except Europe. Um, and, and they're the only other party in Britain that's honest about their European policy. They're not competing with each other for voters. They're both competing with the other two parties for voters. UKIP are competing with Conservatives and actually with Labour, a book about to be published tomorrow showing that naturally a lot of 
Uh, it's called Revolt on the Right by uh, Rob Ford and Matt Goodwin. Um, their main argument is the real threat of the rise of UKIP is to Labour in the north of England and the Midlands. So UKIP is competing with Lab for Lab Labour and Conservatives for their voters. Lib Dems in urban areas are competing with Labour and, and Conservative uh, voters. I think they'll both benefit from the debate. They're both, they'll agree to disagree. They'll be very polite to each other. Uh, he will, Nigel will be then taken seriously, going to toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Deputy Prime Minister and will be making his case against Europe. It'll be a vehicle, a platform for Clegg. He's not really had a platform since he's been leader, apart from his radio show. This will give him, f he will be on the front pages. And they've got nothing to lose in these European elections at threat of being completely wiped out. So I think they will both benefit from this debate, hence why they've both jumped on this idea of having it. And it'll help Farage, presumably, in his case, either to be seen as part of the four leaders at the next general election or being ruled out, which would be even better for him, wouldn't I it? I think that Clegg will be arguing that he ought to be in the room when they have yeah. their leaders' debates. Yeah. helps with that. Yeah, actually, there was somebody on the floor, I'm sorry, down there. Yeah, the, uh, the British position towards enlargement of the EU, particularly enlargement in Eastern Europe and further enlargement in Eastern Europe and particularly Ukraine. Um, Britain has always been in favour of enlargement. There was a paper published, uh, a working paper of Chatham House published in the eight, late 80s by <coughs> Helen Wallace, now Dame Helen Wallace, called Widening or Deepening, and she argued very strongly that, and this became part of official government policy, that um, widening was a strategy to prevent deepening. It failed. In fact, what, what that perhaps was another major error. Widening has led to more deepening because part of the price of widening is everybody else wanting to deepen first before they widen. We better get the deepening first because we can't get it done if we widen. So let's get, let's get, let, let, it's exactly what, uh, you know, the Amsterdam and the Nice Treaty were about. It was getting new stuff in, free movement of people, justice and home affairs, uh, defence cooperation before they enlarged the Central and Eastern Europe. And in fact, every time there's been an enlargement, there has been more deepening as a price. Um, in terms of the, the next countries on the um, shopping list of the EU, if you like, are uh, the former Yugoslav republics. Um, I think they will come in within the next decade. I think Serbia currently doesn't have that many allies supporting them, unlike previous enlargements. But I think, I think you're going to see a lot of them join, and they will all join well before the Ukraine joins. The problem with the Ukraine is the Ukraine, in geostrategic terms, is far more important to Russia than it is to the EU. And I think we're seeing that now. Ukraine is far more important to Putin. He's willing to put boots on the ground and the Russian public is willing to support him putting boots on the ground. The British government, the German government, the French government, we're not willing to put boots on the ground in the Ukraine and they know that our publics wouldn't support us putting boots on the ground in the Ukraine. That basically is the difference. And Putin knows that. Turkey, I think, by the time the EU is ready to make a decision about Turkey, Turkey won't want to join. Uh, um, and Turkey is now a very important geopolitical player. And in fact, Turkey economically is changing in, in a sense that it could see the EU as a real constraint on, on its sort of economic model that it's developing, because suddenly its labour costs will go through the roof if it joins. It wanted to, to join the EU and wants still officially to join the EU more for political, geopolitical reasons. Uh, and I think, uh, and what was economic reasons, but I think with economic growth in Turkey and the growing strategic importance of <laughs> Turkey in the region, I think it'll get to a point where Turkey thinks we're not going to get that many benefits from the EU, particularly if being EU member means signing up to deeper economic and political union. It doesn't where we're heading in Europe. I think we're going to see the emergence of deeper political union in the core around the euro a, a quasi-federal union. A couple of weeks ago, there was a paper written in a French think tank by the, uh, the Eiffel Group, senior French politicians, arguing that there should be a new federal union within Europe. The German Social Democrats in government with Merkel are in favour of this. And we could see this starting to be the agenda that is put forward. Particularly if, and this is a really critical thing to watch, the German Constitutional Court just made a referral to the European Court of Justice. The first ever referral by the German Constitutional Court to the European Court of Justice on whether or not the, the, the European Central Bank's um, lender of last resort facility is legal under the treaties. The German Constitutional Court is convinced it's not legal and they want the ECJ to confirm that. And they have said to the ECJ, 
and they've tied it up in such tight language that they, it's a test, it's the German Constitutional Court's test of the ECJ. Um, we want you to judge on this. If you judge and say that this, the bailout from the ECB is illegal, we can then trust you to be the Supreme Court of this emerging union. If you strike it down, we will then decide that it, Germany can't participate in these bailout funds, which will kill the bailout funds. So this is, this is a really critical moment for this, because either way, it will mean that they will have to have treaty reform and a new settlement going forward. The British government would love treaty reform, because they think they can then put all their things on the table. But I think treaty reform will mean a subset of the EU signing a new, deeper political union treaty without Britain. But as you sign that, as you describe that, Simon, I mean, it, there's, that sounds like, so once it's a, a, as it were, the German government getting a European, uh, European court ruling, or this European court ruling, on the constitutional operation of the EU, which is a long way from, a very long way from the British House of Commons. You can see that in all of this, it's possible that, in a sense, British Eurosceptics will get that what they want by what you've just described, which is a, a, the famous two-speed Europe with a core going ahead and an outer group a bit like Greater EFTA. I mean, we get that's it. Well, they, that's where they'd end <coughs> they up. They might want that, but, you know, and they might say then we're free and we're sovereign. But there was a report by the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of Commons um, on options for Britain. And the section of the report I find most interesting is where they went to go visit the members of the Foreign Affairs Committees in the Swiss Parliament and the Norwegian Parliament. And the members of these committees said, do not be us. Norway means we have to accept everything the EU does and, and implement it. And we have no say at all. At least you have some say. Switzerland said we have to sign bilateral agreements with the EU and they're much bigger than we are and they always win in these bilateral negotiations. Yes, you're bigger than us, but don't think that you're going to win from the outside. And bear in mind a nice paper in an American law journal a few months ago. My colleague Damien Chalmers sent it to me. It's, the paper starts with the following. American law professor at Northwestern University. The average American, when she gets up in the morning and puts on her makeup, doesn't realise that her makeup is regulated by the EU Cosmetics Directive. And then when she goes down to eat her breakfast, she doesn't realise that her cereals package is regulated by the EU Packaging and Labelling Directive. And then when she gets to work and she picks up her phone, she doesn't realise that her conversation is protected by the EU Data Protection Directive. And then when she takes her kids to lunch and they're complaining why aren't there plastic toys in the Happy Meal, it's because it's regulated by the EU Plastics Directive. This is the United States. You really think that Britain, outside of the EU, would be able to be sovereign to decide all its no, own No, no, I'm not saying it won't be sovereign. It's just say it might, f it might feel better out the v about the version of not being sovereign than it now has, because it wouldn't be, it'd be no more or less sovereign than it is now. It would just feel a bit more comfortable about itself, self-described. Perhaps. Yeah, we've got to stop. We've got to stop, I'm it's afraid. It's half past six. We'll be back next week. A great lecture, Simon Hicks. <laughs>